Okay, this is chapter 40, OBGYN examinations. So the OBGYN practice focuses on the female reproductive system. Like I said, OB stands for obstetrics, GYN stands for, or gyne stands for gynecology. Um, this is only the female reproductive system. The person that would see a man for his reproductive system would be a, ur a urologist, somebody that specializes in the urinary tract. Um, because that is the same tract that the reproductive process works through in a, um, a male system. Obstetrics focus on pregnancy and childbirth. And then gynecology addresses diseases and disorders of the female reproductive system. You can, as a female, see a regular doctor for gynecologic health. But in most cases, we would refer you to a um, gynecologist to have a pap smear or to go into depth with uh, reproductive health that way. So the pap test was developed by George Papanicola in 1883. It is a screening test used to determine um, if there's any cancer in the cervix or any kind of abnormal cells in the cervix or on the cervix. Um, which can be largely indicators of, you know, what kind of cervical health you have. Um, it requires patient education. So you want to make sure that your patient is prepped and aware of what they're getting into when they come into that exam. There are different types of solutions that we use to sort of, or to um, maintain the material or the cells that we put into the, the containers after we test, we, we remove them so that we can test them. Uh, that would be the thin prep, the auto site, and the focal point, which is formerly known as the auto pap. And it always follows the American Cancer Society guidelines. So it is important that all females have a pap test by the time they're about 21. Um, I believe the recommendation, it might have changed since I was last in industry, but the recommendation used to be that um, if your first one is normal, that every two years, unless there's something abnormal going on or there's problems, um, but until you're a certain age and then after you hit a certain age, then they have you do it once a year. It used to be yearly all the time. It has since changed because they found that you don't need to go as frequently. Um, but if you're ever having problems with your, you know, your reproductive tract, it's really important that you reach out to a gynecologist and go see them and have them check it because they are the expert. So to prep a patient for a pap test, you want to schedule them at least five days after their menstrual cycle. This is really important because you don't want them to be on their menstrual cycle while they're in there getting this exam. Number one, it can be um, a little bit uncomfortable for your patient, but number two, it makes it hard to see. If you have any visible abnormalities in the um, on the cervix or in that area, if you are menstruating, it would be difficult to see those abnormalities. So you want to avoid scheduling it during that time. And you want to make sure it's at least five days after to ensure that everything is more visible. Avoid the following 48 hours prior to the test. So before you have your patient come in, you want to tell them to avoid the next, these following things for 48 hours. Um, tampons, birth control foams, jellies or creams, no douching and no sexual intercourse. These are all things that can change or make results abnormal, make things more um, difficult to visualize and actually change the results of a patient's exam. So these are all things that you would want to address with your patient. When the patient arrives, you want to make sure that the room is prepared. So you want to have an exam table. Is, uh, we need to use the lithotomy position for this particular exam. If you recall from last chapter, the lithotomy position is where the feet are in the stirrups and the, the patient brings their bottom all the way to the edge of the table. This makes it so that we can visualize um, with the use of a speculum, the cervix, and other things that we need to visualize. Um, it should be clean and have protective covering. That's the paper that we use. You always want to set a gown and a drape sheet on the end of the table for the patient. Nine out of ten times, the patient will not need assistance getting these gowns and stuff on, but if they do, you're there for that purpose also. But you definitely want to make sure that you give them a gown because there's nothing worse than sitting on a table with nothing on. Like, you need to give them a gown. They need to be comfortable. 
And then you want to give them a drape also to put around their waist. And then it could be cloth or disposable paper. Usually it's disposable paper. You want to place an exam lamp within the reach of the examiner's stool at the end of the table. So that like that gooseneck lamp that we have in the back of the lab, that can be moved so that the physician can angle it at whichever degree it needs to be so that they can see what they need to see the best. So you want to make sure that that's within the physician's reach. You as an MA are going to be in the room with the physician because you don't let physicians don't perform these exams usually without somebody in the room because of safety. You want to make sure that the patient feels comfortable, but you also want to make sure that they can't come back and say, oh, well, Dr. So-and-so did this to me or did this to me. There always needs to be somebody to, um, as like a second pair of eyes. <coughs> so when you're in there, you want to make sure that your patient's comfortable as well. Preparing the room. Uh, so we have in the back of the room, we have a mayo stand. That mayo stand is a metal stand that has like wheels that you can move around. This also needs to be next to the physician because this is where you're going to be handing and they're going to be grabbing things off of the tray for the exam. So the tray will include, <coughs> excuse me, all of the instruments and supplies and place it'll be placed in a convenient location. So if they're sitting on a stool, you'll want to lower the mayo stand so that they're not reaching above their head to get an item off of there. It'll be at like eye level so they can say, oh, okay, well now I need this curette. I need these gloves. I need this, etc." <coughs> you want to always cover the mayo stand with a mayo stand cover to protect the surface and to protect the items you're putting on the surface. And then you also want to cover all of the equipment. And this is something that I don't think a lot of people talk about. When you are prepping trays for exams like this, you want to cover the equipment with some kind of towel or something so that the, the patient's not sitting there looking at all these things and going, oh my gosh, and like getting anxious or causing, <coughs> maybe they're getting scared because they see these scraping tools or something that's kind of like scary, but in reality, it's not. So that's something you always want to do. <coughs> okay, so uh, we've prepared the room. We've prepped the patient for the most part. Now we're going to prepare the patient um, for the exam itself. So you're going to provide them with the instructions um, of, to collect a specimen if applicable. So if you go in for an obstetric screening, you would be giving a urine specimen every time. If you're going in for um, like a venereal, like an STD check or an STI, a sexually transmitted infection check, then they would also probably request a urine because sometimes those are visible there. You want to make the patient feel comfortable. You want to explain the procedure and instruct them to undress and put on the gown. Assist in gowning if they need help and then also assist them onto the examination table. With obstetrics, you might encounter this more because the more pregnant a woman becomes, <coughs> the more uncomfortable they are, the more difficult normal motions might become sometimes. So it's something to be considerate of. When you are assisting with the examination, your purpose in a pap smear is to just hand instruments and to hand required um, content over to the physician and to ensure the patient's safety and comfortability. But something that we can do as MAs is we can assist with breast examinations if applicable. So if the doctor is going to is going to do a breast examination or requests one, you can assist with that. And then you can teach the patient how to do their own examination. <clears throat> I will be showing you that today with the models that we have. And then you want to help the patient into the lithotomy position if necessary. Most of the time we can do that on our own. Um, I think the thing that I encountered most when I worked in industry was just having to have the patient scoot clear to the end of the table um, for visualization. So. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. So assisting the provider as requested during the pelvic exam, the pap test is your responsibility. We do not do the examination because medical assistants cannot examine. We do not do any testing. We're not, we're not physicians. We just follow the orders of the physician and ensure that the patient's <coughs> comfort and safety is being, in, is taken into account and that the physician's getting the right material for the um, exam. So you're going to assist the providers requested this diagram here. This diagram here shows you um, with the speculum 
how the physician can see through there and visualize the cervix and possibly depending on if they're pregnant or what the stage of what's going on uh, past that. But yeah, so this is the speculum inserted into the vaginal canal uh, for visualization purposes. After the exam, the patient feels, uh, make sure the patient feels comfortable. Help the patient off the exam table. <clears throat> Offer tissues to wipe off excess lubricant. This is important. This is just common courtesy. And this is something that people don't think about often enough. But not only does your patient feel uncomfortable because of what they just went through, but then you leave um, the stuff that you, the, the jelly down there that you need to insert the speculum, then you're making them even more uncomfortable for a longer period of time. So try to be considerate. Ask the patient to get dressed. Explain when the um, when to expect the results of the report. A lot of times your physician will just mail you the results. Um, <clears throat> in healthcare, we have a saying, no news is good news. If you don't hear, if you don't get a phone call from the doctor, then it means you're probably okay. Um, if you get your results in the mail, you're probably okay. If your results are abnormal, they'll call you, um, which is more concerning than just receiving a notification via mail or not receiving anything at all. No news is good news. Explain when they should expect those results, though, how long that process takes, and then assist in the scheduling of a follow-up appointment. Most of the time, like I told you, if you're a young, healthy female, the follow-up appointment would be anywhere from one to two years, depending on what your physician recommends, or if there's any testing or additional diagnostic stuff that needs to be completed afterwards. After the examination, you're going to clean the room. Make sure you wear gloves to protect yourself. You're going to restock supplies, and you're going to place the labeled specimen and attached requisition form in the proper area for pickup. So... In a pap smear, they scrape the cervix and they take some of those cells and they put them into a container with a solution that needs to be properly labeled for patient identification. And then it gets submitted to a lab for testing to see if those cells are cancerous, non-cancerous, etc. That's what this is referring to right here. <clears throat> so there are different um, procedures that are performed in a, gynecology's, a gynecologist's office. Uh, they can be used to make decisions regarding the condition of the uterus and the cervix. For instance, instruments that could be used for uterine sounds, uh, curates, which cut or scrape, and then biopsy forceps, which actually where you go in and it takes a piece of the cervix out to be tested for more in-depth procedures. Obstetrics, providing direct care to women during pregnancy, childbirth, and immediately thereafter. So in healthcare, MAs can do a lot of things, and I think a lot of things that people don't realize is that we can work in obstetrics and we can work on labor delivery floors, which is really cool. The role in an obstetric includes documenting information completely, stressing compliance with checkups. It's really important that medical assistants advocate for patients, but it's also important that we make sure that they advocate for themselves and that they stay educated and they, come, they stay compliant in their physician's offices. And then you want to provide them with education and, pay, and answer questions. <clears throat> Even if you're just a, an ear to listen to what they have going on and maybe offer some, some sage words of wisdom, that's definitely helpful. The doctor will perform the health assessment and history, will complete the exam, will do all laboratory and diagnostic tests. Now, like I told you earlier, um, if you're pregnant, you go to an OB office, you're going to do a urine specimen. MAs can run those. MAs can test those. That's not a big deal. MAs can collect specimens. We can do pregnancy tests. We can do all kinds of different things. Um, <clears throat> we are able to do that, but only with an order from a physician, okay? So there are three stages to pregnancy. The first stage is the first trimester, which is week 1 to 12. The second trimester is week 13 to 28, and the third trimester is weeks 29 to 40. A normal pregnancy runs about 37 to 41 weeks, and infants before 37 weeks are considered premature. I don't believe that that's entirely the case these days with technology the way that it is. I feel like a baby born at 36 weeks is pretty, is pretty standard, um, but... You definitely want to get that baby to as much as full term as possible. And then there's Nigel's rule, which is a formula for estimating the date of delivery. This has always been a little controversial. 
So you start with the first day of their last menstrual period. So when you're, as an MA, when you're checking a patient in, in a, an OBGYN's office, you're going to say to them, okay, when was your first day of your last, what was your LMP or like the first date of your last menstrual period? That's going to help us identify when they might be due to deliver. Then you're going to subtract three months. It's a whole equation. And then you're going to add seven days plus one year. And that's their due date. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Um, each pregnancy is unique. Procedures and tests performed at the discretion of the provider and the patient is based on needs. Sometimes they don't need to do those tests. They're in your textbook, table 40-1. There is a, a table that gives you the common tests and procedures that could be administered during pregnancy. Um, doesn't mean that they will be, but they oftentimes are. You always want to make sure when you're doing a pregnant patient visit that you're interviewing them and determining any problems and recording remarks and symptoms. Always take their vital signs and request a specimen, a urine specimen, if applicable. We need to make sure that the pregnant woman's health is 100% all the time. Check the chart. Make sure all lab reports are provided and ensure all studies or referral letters are included so that we, when the physician gets in there to see the patient, they have all the information that they need, right? When we're preparing our patient for their actual exam for the prenatal visit, you want to instruct them to undress and put their gown on. You want to assist the patient onto the exam table. You want to drape the patient's legs. A lot of time they'll do this themselves, but just be aware that this is something that you might do. And then you want to tell the doctor when that patient's ready to be seen. I know that the OBGYN offices where I live and where I used to work have a button on the wall. I don't know if some of them, maybe you've seen these before too. Like when the patient's ready, either the physician or the MA or the nurse will push the button on the wall and it'll light up in the, in the lab area. And it'll alert the physician to go into the patient's room and that they're ready for the exam. I think that's really cool. They also have call buttons. So they can like intercom so they can communicate with the, the nurse's office or the nurse's lounge if um, they need to. So when we're assisting the provider during the exam, you want to make sure that they're positioned correctly and assist the provider as appropriate. A lot of times they might say, hey, can you grab me this? Can you do this, et cetera, et cetera. Patient care after the exam. So you're, again, you're going to help them sit up. Okay, a lot of times these pregnant ladies are tired, their backs hurt, and then you have them laying on this, this bed that's uncomfortable. You might need to help them up. So it never hurts to put your hand gently behind their back and then hold their hand the hold their hand and then just assist them up slowly and carefully as to not make them dizzy. You want to instruct them to get dressed and answer any questions that they might have. Help make a follow-up appointment. Then you're going to document in the patient's chart what you guys did, clean the room, and restock the supplies. That's it. That is OBGYN visits.